Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Co-Parenting 101, the Robert C. Wood Early Childhood Center's OWL series. This workshop will cover what healthy co-parenting looks like, steps to effectively communicate, and also how to support our, ch our children through this change. I appreciate your patience and time, and welcome to the workshop. Now, um, I'm the school social worker at the Robert C. Wood Early Childhood Center. So I work a lot with children that are experiencing change, divorce, and also I talk very um, frequently with parents about the best ways to work as a team and to co-parent to best support our students. So let's get started. So what is co-parenting? Co-parenting describes a parenting situation where the parents are not in a marriage, cohabitating, or a romantic relationship with one another. There's different types of co-parenting. Um, sometimes it's not voluntary, so it could be court ordered. This is ordered when custody is disputed. Parties are given different dates to attend classes and the goal is to have the parties attend these classes prior to entering mediation. If ordered, it's to be basically in a better frame of mind to enter into the agreement. So this is determined in court um, and it's mandated. This helps parents help themselves through this major life change as well. So if mediation is ordered, parties will meet with a court mediator in order to arrive at an agreement. And this is an agreement that both parties work on. Visitation also is discussed, um, agreements filed, and other court dates for custody and visitation will also be removed. You may also meet with a facilitator directly after your scheduled conference. So this is all, again, under the umbrella of the court ordered mediation. Um, and this is usually when there's a marriage involved um, and it's through uh, going through the divorce. So let's get into what co-parenting looks like. This basically is just what healthy co-parenting looks like. And it's a lot similar to what a healthy relationship looks like, what a healthy business relationship looks like, basically what any type of relationship makes good and positive. So regular communication, happy and secure children, attending events together without tension and recognizes each other's purpose. So this basically kind of makes everything harmonious and good but we know in an ideal situation in reality, we can't sometimes control the other partner, but this would be basically what healthy co-parenting would feel and look like. So flip the script, what does healthy co-parenting co look like? Unhealthy. When the partner uses children to manipulate one another, disagreeing in front of each other, I'm sorry, disagreeing with each other in front of children, overstepping boundaries continuously, and also making important decisions without any discussion. And I'm sure some of you have experienced this. And usually when the initial um, uh, divorce is happening or split up or whatever is going on, emotions are heightened. Everything's very, very high and activated. So that usually creates the disagreement, the disagreeing, the overstepping of the boundaries, um, but there's a way to kind of like rein that in and not have that be the consistent pattern throughout the entire process and for the duration of your child's upbringing. So let's look at that this a little bit further. So the factors that create better outcomes for our children, the number one piece would basically be to reduce, reduce parental conflict. So parents who are able to reduce their conflict and who have a tendency to get along without turmoil and aggression, they create better adjustment environments for their children. So when, when parents begin to refrain from the conflict, their energy isn't put into that. So the takeaway basically is to refrain from fighting in front of your children. It's hard, emotions are high, tensions are rising. There's lots of history sometimes, and um, sometimes there's uh, feelings of betrayal, betrayal vulnerability, but at the time, the takeaway is when our children are present, we got to kind of rein that in and refrain from fighting in front of them. Because nine times out of 10, their default is to think it's their fault. They don't understand it. And that's a whole other piece we'll get to. 
reassuring our children that they are not to blame. So many children have a tendency to blame themselves, like I just said, for the parents' divorce. And I work a lot with little ones who they don't understand why mommy and daddy can't live in the same house. Did they do something wrong? Did they forget to um, do their chores? And, and this is just our children's natural ability to default to taking ownership of things and personalizing things. And that's very typical, especially at preschool age. So the takeaway is to reassure your children that they are not to blame. Answer your children's questions honestly while avoiding unnecessary details. So this is just very honest, upfront, concrete, and not giving too much details or uh, you know, saying something like daddy was being this or that. So it's very um, unbiased when we're talking to our children. We're kind of just giving the facts and reassuring them that we love them. The next piece is not being put in the middle. So loyalty conflicts create emotional turmoil for children. And this is the basically uh, taking a side, who do you wanna be with, asking them for information about the other partner, refraining from speaking negatively about your children's other partner um, also puts them in the middle. And I think this is a piece that uh, caregivers don't realize that when they talk negative about the other partner in front of a child, it does placate that child automatically into the middle. So it's not just about asking questions and probing, it's also about speaking negatively about the other parent in front of your child. And I think that is a huge takeaway from this message. Also a stable loving relationship with both parents. So children adjust better, obviously, if they maintain consistent, predictable, positive relationships with both parents and also dependable visiting patterns. This is ultra important because if one week is this, one week is that, it's gonna create a lot of dysregulation in our children. So be consistent, try to be on time when picking up your children because their anxieties are high, they're going to a different house, they're gonna miss the other parent, there's a lot happening. So we kind of give them that safe place by arriving on time, giving our child permission to have a loving, satisfying relationship with the other parent and that's basically what makes the stable, loving relationship with both. So in that, the being on time and the patterns and transitions, there's a difference between routine and ritual. And I'm sure some of you have heard this before, but um, basically routine is like waking up in the morning, uh, brushing our teeth, putting our shoes on and going to work. A ritual is something that is thoughtful and meaningful and special to our children. So supporting transitions by creating a ritual, it basically makes something that your, ch your child can count on. It's something special. So when they get home, maybe the special treat is that you and your child uh, go for a walk down the road to kind of talk about the weekend, or you guys sit together and read a story something that you both enjoy together to kind of create a ritual. So they look forward to it as soon as they get back. Um, it could be as simple as meeting them at the door with a smile, even um, taking them to have a snack, something that kind of like becomes that ritualistic behavior. Your child may have a lot of emotions lurking beneath the surface. So when you provide that stable environment and a predictable routine coupled with that ritual, it can help them settle in faster. So remember that the personal emotional state that you're in will, will also affect your child. So if you're heightened when they get home, you know, try it at your best to kind of be constant. And, you know, during those transitions, I know it's a lot of remembering, packing a bag, getting in the car, but if you remain calm, they're going to respond to that calm that you're showing. Um, it might also be emotionally charging for you to see the partner, to anticipate what they're going to say, but, but as long as they see you as that constant, stable person, it's going to affect their emotional state positively. So again, this is another piece I get asked often. And sometimes the, the children at my school, at our school, ask me this too. What about my toys? What about my things? While it's important to cultivate responsibility in kids of a certain age, encouraging them to organize their own things a few days away can actually offer a lot for them to keep track of. So our little ones, even as young as preschool, you can make a little list, you can draw a list, and it could be as simple as my stuffed animal, uh, my toothbrush, and my pajamas. And maybe those are the three things that your child is responsible to remember. If they do happen to misplace someone something, try not to make them feel guilty. 
because I always tell parents, how often do we have to pack for like a three day vacation in the middle of the week? Sometimes they're bound to forget. And this is again, for older kids as well that are going through this, you know, we have to give them a little grace and flexibility with this. So also try to minimize the number of items that have to stay only at your house. This also creates anxiety. Let your child kind of lead the way with this. It'll take the stress off of them. The items are the child's to use and enjoy, and it's ideal for them to be able to take some of their portable things like their favorite clothes and toys to either of them, their homes. It's not about you, you personally holding on to what you want at your house. I would let that, that go and just let your child choose what they feel safe bringing to and from houses. And you could say, I buy these clothes. I want them to stay here, but ask yourself, what, what's the trade-off to that? My child feeling sad because they can't wear their favorite shirt or their favorite skirt over to mommy or daddy's house. And again, different expectations. This is a huge piece because we're not all the same. Everyone has different expectations. No matter how similarly you and your co-parent run your households, there is gonna be differences. It could be big, it could be small. If you find yourself frustrated that a certain message isn't going on, like something as simple as like shoes go in the closet, they don't sit at the door. It may help to remember that the rules are different and that is a new normal, probably for you to accept and for your child to accept. If you were functioning under one household, there's now two households and you're running one and your partner's running one. So ask them, say, you know, these are my rules and this is, compassionately what our rules are here. Um, we don't have iPad at, at dinner. We, um, we clean up after we eat our snacks. We put our dishes in the dishwasher. Um, we put on silly music and it's okay to jump on the couch even I've heard. And some parents will say that's not okay at my house, but other parents will say this is okay at mine. So create a way for um, your kids to know what goes on at your house. It could be a simple list, things that are very important to you that um, that they remember. Homework is done before TV, whatever the case may be, make your expectations and rules clear. So let's kind of transition to effective communication. And if anyone has questions, um, feel free after the presentation to hang on and also email me. Um, my email is ecarlo at lehsd.org. And I'm pretty good with email. If there's any questions or clarifications on anything we're talking about tonight. So effective communication, this goes for not just co-parenting, but for basically any situation where you're in a relationship with, with someone, it could be a, a family member, it could be a partner, it could be a coworker. If there's ever conflict or a problem, the first step is identify the problem. So whoever has the problem is responsible for bringing it up as soon as possible. So you state the problem clearly and concretely. I am feeling, and I always say I statements, I, 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 I am feeling angry because you keep picking up so-and-so Bobby Lee. And it is making me late to, to work Monday mornings. The person receiving the message should reflect back. I hear you saying you feel angry. Tell me what is it that upsets you? So the other person can reiterate, you know, you're picking up Lee. And, you know, it's causing a lot of chaos after I drop the kids off because I'm not at work on time. Is there any way you could leave the house like 10 minutes earlier? So that kind of opens up as we continue the one suggested solution. So let's say I'm bringing up the problem. I'm saying you're, you know, picking up the kids late. Maybe could you leave 10 minutes earlier? Um, would that, would that maybe make things a little easier um, for everybody. I know it would definitely help my morning. So the solution can be discussed and the other person may offer another suggestion. So the other partner could say, you know what, maybe, maybe I'll get gas the night before. Maybe I'll get gas on the, you know, after work the morning before, and maybe I'll pack the lunches the night before. So it's just basically, you know, exploring what a solution is. And this is just an example of like the late thing. It could be a huge problem or a very small problem with the, the partner. There is no right or wrong solution. It's just workable and flexible. So it's not about you being right or wrong. It's more about it just being flexible and each party basically agreeing, talking about how you'll put it to action. And then the W's, how are we gonna do this? Who's gonna do this? Maybe 
I agree to meet halfway. So it's not, you know, maybe the other partner can save some time as well. So meeting in the middle somewhere. So you're both kind of like relinquishing that control and saying, let's try to meet in the middle about the solution. What could it be? And trust me, this isn't always easy. And it takes a lot of honing in and practice, but it's definitely going to help in any situation when there's conflict. So to summarize, use I statements, avoid you statements. And this is automatic in human nature. You let Katie get away with too much. So how does that feel? You're like backed into a corner. Instead, focus on what you're feeling about a certain behavior and why. Because you're not backing someone into a corner, you're very genuinely saying, I worry that Katie is getting mixed messages from us. So that feels not as threatening and not as accusatory. You're owning your feeling. And then you're saying Katie's getting mixed messages from us. Be an active listener. Try not to focus on what you'll say next. That is so important. So we say to our little ones, turn your listening ears on and listen to what the other person's actually telling you. Check your understanding. Sometimes things are lost in translation, especially, you know, with co-parenting, um, you know, individuals who are out to kind of like hear what they only want to hear, reiterate. So you're saying that Katie's getting mixed messages from us. So basically the I statements are when something happens, I feel, or our children feel when, let's say when you, I don't know, when you don't go to this event or when you don't show up, um, let's say the time thing, when you don't show up on time, our children feel confused because they don't know what time you're coming. I would like you to, and this is very simple, show up 10 minutes earlier, I statements. And again, all parents have disagreements. It's not gonna be perfectly orchestrated. This is gonna like, you know, solve, all the problems in the world. It's not about not having disagreements. It's how you work them out. So it's teachable moments. I always tell parents and kids, it's okay to have a disagreement. It's okay to not get along with someone, but how are we going to work this out? How are we going to find a solution? Solving problems together models for our kids, such important characteristics and helps make them feel safe and learn how to resolve conflicts. So actually, I tell parents sometimes, divorce sometimes is a great teachable it, event in a child's life because the child could look back and have a whole different worldview on the divorce. If the parents are completely great with one another, they're co-parenting effectively, the child learns that, you know what, sometimes people don't get along and they don't fit together anymore and they need to maybe live in different houses or not be in in a marriage anymore. And that's okay because look, my mommy and daddy still are friends. They get along or it's just being amicable. Even if you're not friends, just being very, you know, cordial with someone, not doing low blows that teaches our kids. You know what? This is how we work on problems. We, we don't make someone feel bad. We work together because we still are a family. So I'm going to touch on anger because anger fuels a lot of um, the conflict with co-parenting. Behind anger is usually pain, nine times out of 10. People that are extremely anger, they may be expressing it to deal with powerful feelings. They also, the flip side might be, they want to feel powerful and in control because anger is very powerful. I mean, it could suck the life out of a room. It could suck the energy out of a situation if someone's yelling and very, very heightened. It could also be to avoid looking at one's own problems in the relationship. So if someone's just angry and yelling and this and that, they could be avoiding really what's going on in their life deep down. It could also be a way that when they bring up something that's wrong or not the right way, it keeps the communication open with the other parent. So that I've heard often too, that one parent just wants to kind of keep tabs on the other parent engage, but they take the, the route of let me find something that's wrong or let me accuse them of something because for some reason they want to hold on to that relationship. But there's a way to do it without anger 
and without the arguing. There's also the piece of finances, and this again can be expensive. It causes the stress as well. Um, and this is just me reiterating that, you know, both parties, there's going to be this tit for tat, you know, the strains of moving in from one house to two house are, are evident, especially in the times we're in right now. So I always say, you know, provide that adequate child support. If that's, if that's your role, who is that going to hurt, hurt and harm in the end? It's going to send a negative message to our children because they're not going to be able to access what they need. Do not discuss child support issues with your children. Use non-payments as leverage. Do not use non-payment as leverage. Like if you don't pay me, you're not going to see Bobby. That is only going to harm your kids. How to cope with that anger over anything, finances, over not following the schedule, over not effectively communicating. If you're having a conversation, take a big deep breath. <sighs> Arrange meeting in a public place. I always say that's always safe. Don't confine yourself, just basically confine your, what I'm saying is confine yourself to the one issue. Um, don't bring in all these other things to it. And take the time to check your real thoughts and feelings around it. Maybe do a little reflection before you kind of dive into the conversation. And if you do feel like you're being attacked, just slow down and try to figure out what the person is really trying to say. And that takes a lot of skill and time, but if you're feeling attacked, just pause if you feed right into it, it's just going to end even worse. So take that higher road and maybe even take a time out. I need a minute and go outside for a minute. I'm going to kind of regroup. Can we talk about this in two minutes? Give me some time. I need to kind of think. And that's okay too. Ultimately, the goal is to work as a team. If the parents, if you both have adjusted in a healthy way to the divorce or the separation, the children will also. This process can be facilitated also through counseling and through the mediation. So there's lots of supports out there for this transition. I always say have a positive mindset. I mean, it's heartbreaking sometimes. It, it's You're grieving even. Sometimes it's extremely triggering and traumatizing what's happening in your life. So regardless, just try to keep that positive mentality. Think of your kids and parents approach divorce the way you approach it affects the way your children are going to perceive it. Like I said before, it's workable rather than a dysfunctional situation. It is so common these days. There are so many blended families. There are so many um, families that have unique situations and circumstances, and a lot of them are making it work. You reassure your children that they are loved and will be taken care of no matter what. And that's always the number one most important. A united front is always what I say you need to create. So try to agree ahead of time on general discipline strategies, rules, and consequences. This goes back to like how there's different expectations at houses. Then be sure to support each other's decisions unless safety is as a risk. I said safety is like a deal breaker. They're like, we're riding quads without helmets on. We're doing this. And this is where we go here. And this person's watching them that you don't know. You can always say, no, that's a, you know, that's not a safe. That's, that's risky. I don't like that. But besides that, kind of micromanaging the other partner's um, way they do things is not going to benefit anyone. So create that united front, accept that things are going to be different at the other house, and that's okay. So I also like, before we wrap up, all the people listening, just for a moment, ask yourself what has been the most difficult part of all this because it's different for everyone. And how are you coping with this? It's just a quick check-in with how you're doing. And I can answer questions after too. And as we wrap up and we kind of think of what's been the most difficult part, how we're all coping, I wanna extend again my way to contact me. It's 609-296-7131. And my extension is 4112. And again, I work with kids on an individual basis. I also do um, lots of readings about family changes and um, how to cope with changes inside our family. 
There's lots of resources out there, books, and um, a couple of my favorites before I wrap up are It's Not Your Fault, Coco Bear. That's on Amazon, you, you could find. And um, the Goodbye book is a great one because it talks about, you know, separation. The um, There's lots of, of ways that books can help open up that conversation and make it so that the children say, oh, the bear is feeling this and I'm feeling this too and that's okay. Um, drawing pictures and never have the hesitation of seeking out counseling too for your, your, you and your kids because it's only gonna benefit them. They'll be in a safe place and they'll be able to talk about what they're feeling. So that about does it for my presentation. Um, I'll hang on for a little bit for any questions privately and have a wonderful day. Thank you all for your time.